Welcome. First, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming here on this icy night to listen to Dr. Fisk's talk. Ask all you like about 9-11, but for heaven's sake, don't ask why. Um, this talk would not have been possible without the generous funding and the kind support of our uh, sponsors, the uh, uh, Dean of uh, Graduate Students, the uh, Center for International Studies, the uh, Dean of uh, Humanities and Social Science, and the uh, um, Technology and Culture Forum, um, and the Program um, for Human Rights and Justice. Um, a group of MIT students and MIT student organizations dedicate a lot of their time to ensure the success of this event. I would like to acknowledge the help and support of all the student organizations you see listed here. Um, Amnesty International, Social the Social Justice Cooperative, the Thistle, the South Asia Forum, the Muslim Students Association, the MIT Student Cable, the uh, Pakistani Student Society, the Arab Student Organization, the MIT Greens Party, the Palestinian Awareness Committee, and the Alliance for a Secular and De Democratic South Asia. Okay, so finally I'd like to yield the floor to Professor uh, Balakrishnan uh, Raja Gopal, whom uh, the director of the um, uh, MIT program on human rights and justice, whom we've invited to uh, introduce uh, 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 tonight's speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Gives me great pleasure today to uh, welcome Robert Fisk who is a distinguished um, foreign correspondent for the Independent of London to MIT today. Um, and to talk on the, on the subject, ask all you like about 9-11, but for heaven's sake, don't ask why. 9-11 um, has been uh, a turning point in many ways, but particularly um, in one significant way, which is often missed in the United States, uh, listening to the discussions. And that is in terms of constituting a kind of a Westphalian moment in the transformation of international relations, in laying the basis for a fundamental transformation of the legal framework of international relations, because that's exactly what has been going on. Um, the attack on 9-11 was a catastrophe, a crime against humanity. And the amazing thing was that as of 9-11, international, the international society was progressing gradually towards establishing rules and mechanisms for bringing accountability to exactly those sorts of crimes. There were two important international conventions that were in, under negotiation on terrorism. Uh, the International Criminal Court had been established in 1998. Uh, the crime of aggression had been put on the agenda again. So much could have been accomplished, but almost willfully the opportunity has been thrown away. And instead what we have seen is a deliberate and calculated dismantling of the basic structures of international law painfully and against much resistance built over 150 years. The role of the media in that has been phenomenally important, and in the United States, phenomenally disappointing. In the human rights program, we put together a panel discussion on bias and human rights reporting in the media um, last semester. And for those of you who are interested, you could contact the program. We'd be happy to provide you with a copy of the report. It was astonishing that just the week following, for the one week following 9-11, there, were, there was some semblance of self-critical examination of 
why would people hate us so much? Why there would be this much opposition to U.S. policies and whether there could be a re-examination of the structural causes of some of the violence. But that was just for that one week, and then it disappeared. So these two missed opportunities, the missed opportunity to build a society based on institutions and norms, as well as the opportunity to examine in a self-critical manner the structural causes of violence, both are terribly interconnected and certainly important for, in the context of the war preparations against Iraq right now. And there is no one who is more qualified to talk about that than Robert Fisk. Robert Fisk has, over the years, covered the Iranian Revolution, the Iran-Iraq War, the Persian Gulf War, and the conflict in Algeria. Dr. Fisk has been the recipient of 25 awards for his work and is a seven-time winner of the British International Journalist of the Year Award, a two-time winner of the Amnesty International UK Press Award, and a winner of the Johns Hopkins SIAS CIBA Prize for International Journalism. Dr. Fisk is also the author of three important books on, on uh, uh, one called The Point of No Return, The Strike Which Broke the British in Ulster. Second, In Time of War, Ireland, Ulster, and the Price of Neutrality. And third, the pity the nation, Lebanon at war. If there is a journalist who has embodied the tradition of speaking truth to power, it's Robert Fisk. It gives me great pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I have to <coughs> apologize to you. I've had a fever for the last two days, and I've almost run out of voice. So I'm not going to speak as loudly as I normally do. Forgive me for that. Secondly, I'm glad you weren't asked to turn off your mobile phones. A few months ago, I was giving a lecture in Dublin, Ireland, and I said that anyone whose mobile phone rang while I was talking would be sold into slavery. <laughs> and immediately, of course, a mobile phone rang and it was mine, so it was absolutely... So keep your phones on, doesn't matter at all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> one reason for my hoarseness is that I spent today rushing down to New York to sit in the UN Security Council chamber and watch Colin Powell. I think you learn a lot more about people when you see them in the flesh, when you notice who falls asleep, George Tenet of the CIA, <laughs> And who sounds most pompous? Our own dear Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw. <laughs> I have to say I was not impressed. Sources, foreign intelligence sources, our sources, defectors, sources, sources, sources. Colin Powell's terror talk, the United Nations Security Council, sounded like one of those government-inspired reports on the front page of the New York Times, where, of course, Mr. Powell's speech will no doubt be treated with due reverence tomorrow morning's edition. It was a bit like heating up old soup, as the Algerians say. Hadn't we heard a lot of this before? Should we trust this man? Powell, not Saddam, I mean. <laughs> certainly we don't trust Saddam, and I certainly don't. But Secretary of State Powell's presentation today was a mixture of awesomely funny recordings of Iraqi Republican Guard telephone intercepts, a bit like listening to Samuel Beckett in Arabic. <laughs> How many of you actually listen to them? Yeah, you know what I mean. Hello, 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 hello. It's a wonderful name. <laughs> but, but which just might have contained some very unpleasant proof that, yes, Saddam is again cheating the inspectors. I'm still waiting, by the way, to hear the Arabic for the State Department's translation of, OK, buddy, consider it done, sir. I never heard that in Iraq before, but, you know, <laughs> translators never trust them. Then there was the artistic illustration of mobile biolabs. I don't know if you saw them on television, 
wonderfully beautiful brand new ten-wheeled trucks and astonishingly clean railway wagons, which suggests that the Pentagon has not the slightest idea of the dilapidated nature of the Iraqi army. It was, <clears throat> it was when we went back to Halabja and human rights abuses and all Saddam's old sins, all of them true, that I think the whole thing became a little bit discredited. We mentioned also UNSCOM, endless reports again of what UNSCOM did, forgetting of course that one of the reasons they no longer cooperated with UNSCOM is that it was proved that the CIA was involved with them. And of course there's a man sitting just behind Mr. Powell who knew that very well. Jack Straw may have thought of this the most powerful and authoritative case against Iraq, but when we were forced to listen to Iraq's officer corps Commenting on the phone, yes, yes, you understand, yes. It was impossible not to ask oneself if Colin Powell had really considered the effect of all this stuff on the outside world. From time to time, the words Iraq, failure to disclose, denial and deception, appeared on a giant video screen above Mr. Powell. <laughs> Many of us wondered if this was CNN. <laughs> but no, it turned out it was the work of CNN's sister channel, the US Department of State. <laughs> Because Colin Powell is supposed to be the good cop in the Bush Rumsfeld bad cop routine, one wants to believe him. He's a nice guy. I must say that the Iraqi officer's telephoned order to his subordinate, quote, remove nerve agents whenever it comes up in the wireless instructions sounded perfectly genuine. It looked indeed as if the Americans had indeed spotted a nasty new little line in Iraqi deception. We've got to be fair about that. But a dramatic picture of a pilotless drone aircraft, a little model aircraft, a little tiny aircraft, capable of spraying poisonous chemicals, turned out to be the imaginative work of a Pentagon artist. See what it says in the New York Times tomorrow morning under the caption. It just says, Iraqi plane or imaginative artistic work of. <laughs> when Powell started going on about decades of contact between Saddam and Al-Qaeda, things went wrong. You see, as we all know, decades ago, Al-Qaeda's men and bin Laden was working for us. <laughs> well, it's true that we also had Saddam working for us at that period, but I don't think we were cross-fertilizing our allies. <laughs> and we also had Colin Powell's new version of the President's State of the Union fib, the one about the scientists interviewed by the UN inspectors being, in fact, intelligence agents. You remember Mr. Blix objected to this and said it wasn't true. I'm sure it's not. The UN now, according to the new Powell version, they were scientists being interviewed by the UN, but they weren't the right scientists. They weren't actually nuclear ones. So the, the lie is being softened a bit. That was a good sign. Mr. Powell said that America was sharing its information with the UN inspectors. But it was clear, if you listen carefully to his speech, that much of what he had to say about the alleged new weapons, some of which may well be true, the decontamination truck at Taji, for example, the chemical munitions factory um, at Ibn al-Haytham on November 25th had not been given to the UN inspectors. Why not? Didn't 1441 say that all intelligence information should go to Hans Blix? Is America perhaps not being quite as proactive as it should? The worst moment came, I thought, when Mr. Powell started talking about anthrax and the 2001 anthrax attacks in Washington and New York. Because the implication, of course, was that there was a Saddamite element to this, although most of us know that's almost certainly untrue. There was this point where he held up a teaspoon of imaginary spores. Um, I wondered what was coming next, actually. It was another teaspoon, I think, but I couldn't see too clearly on the desk. When the Secretary of State held up Iraq's support for the Palestinian Hamas organization, which has an office in Baghdad, and also, by the way, in Beirut and Damascus and Tehran, are they next? One did begin to wonder what this meant. Of course, he didn't mention America's support for Israel and Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory. That wasn't there. You know, I thought one of the most macabre moments came when, when Powell entered the Security Council, back slapping, kissing on the side of the face, various delegates and diplomats around him. Jack Straw, our Foreign Secretary, I noticed, positively bounded up for his big American hug. <laughs> There were moments, you know, when you might have thought this was a gathering of statesmen to celebrate peace, they were so happy. Alas, of course, they were planning a war, which may indeed kill the monster Saddam and will indeed kill innocent people. One recalled, of course, standing in that auditorium 
another day, almost 30 decades ago, when one of Mr.